Hi, I'm Dr. Gargi Day. I'm going to walk you through the fun world of food and gourmet meal, but it would be garnished with a lot of research and scientific details. So it's going to be very interesting. Walk with me and you'll find out yourself. Today's topic that I have chosen is chemistry on your dinner plate. Now first let's analyze what is on your dinner plate. Assume that you have bread, you have curry, you have maybe a sauce. If you're lucky you might have let's say some uh, ice cream or custard or you might settle down for uh, yogurt. So when you have all these items on your plate, what is it that is common? Two things. One, that all these food, they are when you dissect it. Yes, you heard me right. When you chemically dissect it, you will see that all the food are made up of solid, liquid and sometimes gas. And because of the fact that almost all foods are multi-component system, Yes, you have carbohydrates, you have proteins, you have lipids, you have minerals, vitamins, so on and so forth. And you also have phytonutrients in case of plant-based food. Yes, but almost all of them can be put under the solid, liquid and sometimes gaseous components, right? And because of the fact that they have solid, liquid and gas, usually they make up what we call as colloidal system. Now that is what is common in all the items that I just now mentioned which may have been present on one of your dinner plates. Now let's analyze what are colloidal systems. Before I take you through colloidal systems, I'm sure you have, almost all of you, should have definitely tried to dissolve let's say common table salt. What is table salt? Sodium chloride. A very small molecular weight compound so you dissolve it and it dissolves very quickly similarly your table sugar that also dissolves very quickly or maybe you have tried to dissolve glucose that also dissolves very quickly why because the particle size of glucose particle size of sucrose which is your table sugar or particle size of uh, any cl they are small particle size right anywhere between one micrometer so that's why when you dissolve it in water, they're called as true solutions. At the same time, let's analyze what happens when you put starch. Starch is a very, very large molecular weight compound. It's a, so it's a solute, which when you put in water, it goes down, it settles down, unless you heat it. And if you heat, then yes, there is some amount of dissolution. But otherwise, for all practical purpose, we do not have a clear, very, very transparent solution. I'm sure you have noticed that. So therefore, we call that as suspension. So any solute which is going to have a particle size much more than 0.5 micrometer is your suspension type of a uh, compound. Now somewhere in between a true solution and a suspension type of solution is what we make up which we call as colloidal systems. So particle sizes which are in between 1 nanometer to 0.5 micrometer is what is going to give you a sol. Right? A sol is defined by the fact that it is a system which can have a dispersed phase and a continuous phase. A dispersed phase, mind you, is a smaller proportion. So let's say we are considering the ratio between a dispersed and a continuous phase. Then the dispersed phase is supposed to be a minor part and the continuous phase is supposed to be a major part. Right? So it's something like your KitKat. I'm sure all of you have it. So what you usually have in KitKat is majorly the wafer. So that could be your continuous phase. And you have a small amount of chocolate, which is, let's say, your dispersed phase. I hope you remember now. Hmm? So depending on what is the dispersed phase and what is in your continuous phase, you have uh, four types of colloidal system. 
Now the first type of colloidal system is called as sol. A typical example is milk. Milk has a lot of small molecular weight compounds. You have lactose, you have vitamins, you have minerals. So all these are dispersed in a continuous phase of water and that's exactly why milk is a good example of a sol. Do we have any other example of sol? Plenty. Let's consider ketchup or sauce. When you increase the amount of solutes in the dispersed phase and you disperse it into a continuum phase of a liquid, then what you effectively come up with is a very very viscous sol. A good example I told you is a sauce or a ketchup. These are good examples of sol. Another good example would be your custard, uncooked custard. Right? So therefore, what do we get over here? We get a first type of a colloidal system which is sol. A sol can be something very liquid like in case of your milk or it could be having a little more body to it, a little more viscous so that becomes a, something like your custard, something like your sauce etc. So that becomes your viscous sol. So, in general, salts are supposed to have a rheology. A rheology means that it's a fluid which is going to have a flow property. That which is dilute is going to flow through fast. That which is a little bit of viscous will have a little difficulty or a little limitation as far as the flow is concerned. Right? Who hasn't had the very very irritating experience of trying to put your sauce which has got sort of condensed especially during winter the sauce refuses to come out so that should that should bring out your memory and that should that should be in your memory as to what is a difficult sauce then you have the next which is what we call as a gel now what is a gel gel has in case of gel the dispersed phase is a solid, phase, uh, sorry, a liquid phase. The dispersed phase is a liquid phase, and the continuous phase is a solid phase. Meaning what? Meaning there is a small amount of liquid and a larger amount of sol or solid, right? So, is a ketchup which has a lot of solid? Can we call a ketchup as a gel? The answer is no. Why? Because what is therefore a typical example of a gel? A typical example of a gel is curd, yogurt. So gelatin, remember you have these gels that you create in your desert deserts. So a gel therefore is very much different from a sol. It's not that if you add a lot of solid you make a gel, no. A gel is supposed to have a small amount of liquid and a very large amount of sol, solid and along with the solid, that solid is supposed to form a 3D structure. Remember, you have gel, gelatin when you make a desert and you make gel, jellies out of it, jams and jellies, especially jellies. So that is your typical gel structure. Similarly you have curd you have yogurt that where the structure is very very semi-solid where you do not want any leakage or any seepage of water that is where you have the solid formed a 3d proper 3d structure and that is your good example of gel now one classic feature of gel and sol is that imagine you've taken gelatin you have dissolved gelatin. The dissolution of gelatin is a sol. But that same gelatin, when you take it to, into your fridge and then you allow the 3D bonds or the 3D structure to be formed because of the bonding of gelatin, that gives you a gel. Right? So what does that mean? That means that a sol and a gel are reversible very important a sol can be made into a gel a milk 
can be made into a curd in that case you need fermentation and in case of gelatin let's say you have just dissolved gelatin and you want to make it a gel so what do you do you simply decrease the temperature by putting it in the refrigeration so that you allow the bond formation that becomes a gel i said reversible means what means that salt can turn into gel and can gel also turn into salt yes the answer is yes when you take the same gelatin which has got a 3d structure and unfortunately you have kept it in the room temperature then what happens it starts to melt sometimes you start to lose if the temperature room temperature is hot or if you have uh, just uh, you know sort of warmed it up then what you get is back to your gelatin solution so in case of gelatin solution yes the salt and the gel can be reversed with a simple change in the temperature so far so good now let's move to the third type of colloidal system which is both the dispersed as well as the continuous phase has liquid in it very interesting so the two types of liquids that we generally have with respect to cooking is one is definitely the water the other is oil remember we always cook in some lipid media it could be butter it could be oil right so when you have when you have the two immiscible liquids coming together to form a structure this is called as an emulsion a good example of emulsion go back to milk milk is also a good example of emulsion so basically milk over here is considered to be a multiple colloidal system it exists as a sol it can turn it can be turned into a gel and milk also exists as an emulsion why because don't forget that along with lactose vitamins minerals milk also has the fat free fatty acids uh fat uh, dissolved some other compounds like your vitamins etc so milk is a very good example of an emulsion so is butter right so you have therefore a very very typical example of emulsification or emulsifying agent and sometimes in indian cooking we we uh, sort it with oil and then we add a little bit of water and then we we form a bit of an emulsion there is also formed by the way so yes the emulsifying agent or the emulsification or the whole chemistry behind emulsification is that an emulsifying agent has both hydrophilic and hydrophobic part now hydrophilic common common uh, languages water loving and hydrophobic is water fearing so in other words we have basically the two types of compounds coming together the hydrophobic and the hydrophilic they form an emulsion they form a structure which we call as an emulsion and then we have a very very interesting uh, form where i told you that apart from solid and liquid we can also have gas so you have you imagine your aerated soft drinks you imagine your ice cream very fond of ice creams i'm sure some of you are so you imagine that ice cream that's what we call ice cream syndrome basically means that a very small amount of milk and a lot amount of air so that's that's why we say ice cream syndrome so there's nothing much going on there but anyway ice cream uh soft cakes bread and then you have aerated drinks these are all your foam foam is where you have a small amount of gas which can be going into so small amount of gas meaning that is the dispersed phase and you have the liquid if you have liquid so you have typically carbonated or uh, aerated drink so that is your hydrosol and you have ice cream and other things where or you have let's say cakes that is your typically uh where you have your so your uh, gas in a continuous phase which is a solid phase like your cake etc or your bread that is typically your solid foam so you have your foam and you have your solid foam right so so far therefore we have foam we have emulsion we have gel and then we have sol sol has a flow property gel has a 3d structure emulsion 
has to have a balance or it has to be emulsified if you make if you want to make an emulsion so you need to have an emulsifying agent otherwise you do not create a very very stable emuls emulsion right and now here is where I'm going to give you a very very uh, common example routine example which I'm sure all of you have noticed so when the milk comes from let's say a uh, farmland right typical milk the raw milk you are able to keep it for let's say a few one or two hours and then after some time the milk is going to split so in this case natural milk unprocessed milk is supposed to be a temporary emulsion yes there is liquid yes there is water but together they do not have enough of the emulsifying uh, power so therefore they become a temporary emulsion whereas you take a UHT milk or you take uh, something which has been processed uh, typically UHT meaning ultra high temperature process which is your tetra pack milk the tetra pack milk if you have noticed does not curdle does not split together very quickly why why because the tetra pack milk or the UHT milk the milk and the lipid part of the milk has been homogenized has been homogenized and has been the milk uh, lipid has been broken into very very small particles lipid particles and they have been during the process of homogenization we have ensured that there is a formation of a permanent emulsion over there and that's exactly why the milk might be spoiled but it will very seldom you will notice the splitting of the milk or the biphasic difference differentiation of the liquid or the solid I mean sorry the liquid part and the lipid part of the milk right so that is a good example of an emulsion and foam we all know we have champagne to aerated drinks to bread to uh, souffle the the cakes the soft cakes that you create so all of you there who are very very fond of cooking i hope this has given you some amount of extra information as to what is being created in your kitchen to help you go through i have some uh, review questions i hope you will take some time off and Try and answer these review questions. It will be great if you can. If not, next time, I'm sure you can do better. Right? So, I hope I've made you hungry for food technology. We are all hungry for food, but I need you to be also hungry for food technology so that I can take you through the research, the fun, the science part of food tech. Meanwhile, please LSSC. Like, share, subscribe. And comment I look forward to your comments especially students out there please reach out to me I would be very happy to interact with you on this channel thank you so much meet you again next week